The reason I really picked this one, because my understanding is not only for our vascular colleague at Stanford, but also for the partner surgery, and I feel still quite a good bulk of general surgeon and cardiac surgeon do this procedure and so forth. And I thought to share with you my own experience doing this. I put it here as three decade, but believe it or not, four decade. But I was feeling maybe I think this guy's too old and maybe demented. So I felt, no, I'll cut it another decade. So I'm going to share with you not only what's presently being practiced in this field, but also hopefully I have 10 minutes or so at the end to share with you the latest clinical guidelines put by the SVS and presently is online at the JVS and there is a printed copy you'll be able to see it this coming month in January. So let's start. There's nothing to disclose. I don't have two point something billion dollar building in West Virginia, but we do have the Vascular Center of Excellence. And if anybody remembers Senator Byrd, he was able to get for us 10 years, 15 years ago, $100 million from the government, and it established the heart and vascular center of our medical center. And that's the heart and vascular center. It has nothing to do with the hospital. And this is where we practice. The topics to be covered, if the time allow me, which I hope it does, is summarized here. We're going to revisit commonly quoted randomized CA trials. Someone might say, why? This is over 20 years old. Because my cardiology colleague, which I hope they are some of them here, is these are the number they quote when they do carotid stenting. They quote roughly 5% plus of perioperative stroke and death for symptomatic patients, and roughly around 3% for asymptomatic patients. So I'm trying to remind the fresh people or the younger people here what the result of this data but you no longer really can quote them because the data today is different than 20 years ago. I'm going to share with you my personal experience. What does this mean? If we follow certain protocol, particularly from randomized trial, then what data would you get in your own institution? And then I'm going to share with you a result of CEA, modern C over the past 10 years or so, and see how it fare in comparison with the national what you call landmark studies. And important lesson, this is for the juniors, means fellows, residents, or anybody who is not interested in doing this very commonly. Important lesson for the management of extra carotid extracranial disease based on level one evidence. And then the big gorilla in America, or perhaps worldwide, is number five. Should above 70% asymptomatic carotid stenosis be treated whether with stenting or endartractomies. And then I probably told that to Jason because of the time I will very, very superficially touch some of the common carotid stenting trial. Hopefully I have time. If not, then we'll go into brief summary of the SVS clinical practice guidelines. Now for the randomized clinical trial, which many people quote still, one, two, three, you see it here. But the one which I need to remind you is the NASET. And of course, in the same breath is the European, the ACST. The asymptomatic is the ACAST, the ACST1, asymptomatic carotid surgery trial one and two, and of course, the VA. Now, that's the number I mentioned to you. The NASET result over 20 years ago, look at the preoperative stroke and death, 5.8%. Keep in mind, 1% of these related to carotid angio, which most of us now, if not all, do not do carotid angio and so forth. And that's my favorite figure for that NASET. Look at the curves for surgical therapy versus even old best medical therapy with CA at roughly 24 months, 26% versus 8%. Almost three to one, almost three to one in favor of CA. That's for the above 70%. <clears throat> and what come even more impressive is when you think of the relative risk for fatal or major stroke. Look at this one here. For CA, two and a half. For medical therapy, was 13%. So there's no doubt the procedure really worked very well over 20 years. But now we believe it even can be better. As you know, for over 50%, the risk reduction was roughly 7% 
but with a number of a stroke of over half a million, that number means a lot. So still even beneficial for patients who had above 50%. ACAS, similar conclusions, except the reduction of stroke was roughly around 50%, and that's only for above 60%, which hardly any one of us nowadays operate in above 60%. But I'm just trying to tell you, even for above 60%, the stroke reduction was roughly around 50%. But keep in mind again, that's the old medical therapy. And we're going to touch this later on. Similar data were showed on the asymptomatic carotid surgery trial, which is European. One and two. The one showed somewhat similar data to the American, the ACAS. And if you notice, the number of sample sizes is almost twice. But look also in the follow-up by Holiday at the Lancet at 2010, even at five years, and look at that, at 10 years, it still is impressive that surgical therapy was superior to medical therapy. How about my own personal experience in Charleston, West Virginia? I really thought to be fair to myself and to you is to share with you only what I have done in the randomized trial. What does this mean? Every one of these were very following very specific protocol. Everybody got a neurological evaluation perioperatively. So I feel they are probably more scientific. And I picked only a decade work between 1998 and 2008. And that gave me over 1,000 patients in this regard, and if you look to the number on the extreme right side, just remember, nothing more than 1%. Forget about half percent and 0.8 and, 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 roughly around 1%, any way you want to dissect it. But keep in mind, none of these patients have a carotid angio. So that's right away a cut down of 1%. So it can be done even in state called state of West Virginia, which means I'm sure it can be done in Stanford. I think this, to me, was the more impressive slide. Why? Look how impressive once you succeed. On the left side, freedom from stroke at five years, 98%. Above 70% tree stenosis rate. Look at this. I always tell my residents and students, if it succeed and you do it the way I personally feel very strongly for patching, you could do a version if you want to, the restenosis rate is roughly around 1%. And that's why we have 94% at five years. So not only is it relatively safe, but impressively durable. Are current results better than NASA and ECAS? The answer, yes. And on this slide, I collected for you series with a relatively large number, several hundred, published in what I feel very commonly quoted prestigious journal. And left side are the author. Look at the extreme right side. Again, less than 1% or 1%. Stroke and death, 1% to 2%. So my point to you is that's the number we need to remember when you compare, <coughs> excuse me, endartractomy versus carotid stenting. So it's doable in many institutions with a result of roughly around 1% to 2% of stroke and death. Most important lesson learned regarding diagnosis and management. And for some of the experts in this room here, please forgive me if I'm going in some of these comments because I'm sure you are familiar with this. But for the sake of the students, residents, and perhaps junior fellows, let's share with you. We start with patient selection. I always say selection, selection, selections. I still follow the NACET or the European CST indications, which mean anything above 50% symptomatic patients or anything was used to be above 60 in the last 10 years, above 70% because we have a better medical management. And two, most of duplex vascular laboratory criteria nowadays, they report to you for above 70, not above 60. How old the patient? It doesn't matter. I call it fit patient of any age. I have operated on someone who's a 90, and I turned down surgery on someone who's in his 50s. So a fit patient of any age, symptomatic above 50, and asymptomatic above 70. What do I do once I decide the procedure needs to be done? 
these are the imaging in front of you. If it's done in my lab, and I always brag about my lab, it's probably the oldest lab in the eastern United States. Take my word for it. Since I lived Gene Strandis in 1978, we have 17 Vassar lab technologists. We are impressively when it comes to Vassar laboratory. If it's done in my lab, unless the ultrasound did not show me exactly what I need to, it's done only based on carotid duplex ultrasound. Unless it's symptomatic, then I need to know is something back on the head or something. If it's from another lab, I go with another imaging. And our common imaging, as all of you know, is CTA. Unless there is a contraindication, I'll get an MRA. And for the students or residents, I don't know about Stanford, is CTA, because I published an article related to this, $1,100 at Charleston Area Medical Center. For an MRA, is between 3,500 up to 4,000. Whether including the neck, with the head, or neck and limited head, it's very, very expensive. Conventional angio is only if we are doing carotid stenting. CA can be safely performed without angio, as all of you know, if it fit these four criteria. And I'm sure most of you know, when you think duplex ultrasound is adequate to take it as, as the imaging of choice for you. Next, we did the imaging, we decided to operate. Timing, if it's TIA, once you get the consult in the hospital, as soon as possible. A day, a two, a three, it's okay. For stroke, we're used to do it in the first 48 hours, but there is enough data to tell us you're probably safer if you do it between day number three and day number 14. I personally even give them up to one week, unless there are certain circumstances where I think I need to do it faster or earlier than that, but I always tell the junior guys somewhere between week number one, but don't last beyond week number two. If it's asymptomatic, go to the beach, enjoy your time with your sweetheart, and you could do it anytime electively. Do I do it under local or under general? It does not make a difference. And I have done both. And why I'm telling you this? Look at this one. I always quote an Italian, has a nice accent like myself, called Dr. Cow. He published the GALA trial, general anesthesia versus local anesthesia. And look at the local versus general. It does not make a difference how you do it. The result is exactly comparable. Not only this, but your Cochrane review also reach to the same. So do it any way you want to and whatever you feel comfortable and based on the expertise you have in your own institution. Now we are in the operating room, carotid dissection. When I was used to be in general surgery over 40 something years ago, I was used to be told in tumor dissection, don't do too much manipulation. Like give the IMA before you do this and end. I look at it the same with the carotid. Don't touch. What do I mean with this? Dissect the tissue of the carotid, not the carotid of the tissue. And that's what you see on this, on this slide here. And if you have to go higher up, you start one item by one item. What do I do with this? You start by the following. Transaction of the sclerosmastoid artery and vein. Let's give you a little bit more lean of the hypoglossal to be pulled gently higher up. Transaction of the posterior branch of the ANSA. If that doesn't do it, transaction of the occipital artery. If that doesn't do it, transaction of the diagastric muscle. And if you notice, I put the two in the bottom in black because I no longer do it. Why? Because now we have carotid stenting. So if I made the judgment in the beginning to operate and I'm stuck in surgery, I do one, a two, a three, a four. If it reach, I have to go with five and six, which I have done. And it does have significant part of morbidity. Then I quit, and the patient will be ended by going into carotid stenting. Do I do any intraoperative monitoring? I did all type of intraoperative monitoring. My answer to you, it does not make a difference either. And there is enough data to tell you it does not make a difference what you do. I, it happened, I routinely shunt. It takes me around 20 seconds to put carotid argal shunt, and you don't need to make it complicated. Do you need to shunt? Of course you don't. In what, maybe 90% of the time you don't. But if you believe in monitoring, 
I think most of these are acceptable, but most of the people they seek for the sake of the students and junior residents, the EEG is the most sensitive, but it's not necessarily the best. I'm just trying to tell you, you could use, of course, any, if you could do it under local, that's even better and better. But you could do any intraoperative monitoring you want to. And that's the value of routine shunting, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, versus not routine shunting. My problem with the people who do not want to shunt hardly any time, when you need to shunt, you are shaky, and I don't think the residents and the follow get the chance to learn how to use shunting when they, when they need to know to shunt. Therefore, I think in teaching institution, you better off to teach your people how to shunt. And of course, what type of technical you do, conventional versus aversion, again, it doesn't make a difference. And that's the aversion, I don't want to go in details. And I think I love the Dr. Ka work, the one who gave us the gala, he gave us the Everest. And this is big time multi-center European uh, look at that, 1,353 patients. He compared conventional versus aversion, and if you look, the data was not significant at all, except look into the cumulative restenosis. If you patch your artery, 1.5% restenosis versus 2.8 for aversion, which was not statistically significant, but if you do primary closure, it was 9% versus 2.8%. So the data were exactly comparable unless you are doing primary closure. Therefore, you do it any way you want to. Cochrane review, the same. So in conclusion related to this segment, conventional versus aversion based on level one evidence, no difference in stroke death between either way, particularly if you are doing patching, both have um, both uh, C and aversion with patching have lower restenosis rate than primary closure. And now we decide to not aversion, conventional. Do I do it with a patch or do I do it with primary closure? Again, for the sake of juniors, based on a survey I made a few years ago, in the 80s, almost 10, 20 percent were used to patch. Nowadays, 80 to 90 percent patch unless you are doing a virgin and that's based on over a dozen randomized trial and it happened almost seven eight of them we almost compare every type of patch to another patch or primary closure to a patch or jugular vein versus saphenous vein based on these data the i always summarize this to my fellows and residents three pluses when you patch one cut down perioperative carotid thrombosis which means cut down perioperative stroke and, of course, late reduction of late restenosis. And I'm going to summarize for you 10 randomized trials. Look into this one here by Cochrane Review, 2010. Perioperative means 30 day result. Any way you look at it, look at the odd ratio on the extreme right side. You cut it by half or one third or even two thirds whether perioperative stroke, whether fatal stroke, whether any stroke, stroke or death, retain 2 or anything you want to, you cut it impressively by using a patch. Late result, again, look at the odd ratio on the extreme right. You cut it by almost half to 0.7 or 0.75 odd ratio by late restenosis. Recently, from the CRIS data by Malas, Look at the number again, patching versus primary closure. You're cutting it from 1.2 stroke to 4% primary closure and above 70% from 3% to almost 11%. A recent finding by also this one here, a major systemic review, 2018, 25 studies, take my word, the same thing was patching superior to primary closure, except, of course, if you're doing aversion. What do I do post-operatively? Everybody get a baby aspirin, unless there is a contraindication. Immediate post-op ultrasound, just for a baseline. 24 hours discharge, casually assent patient home at the end of the evening. Optimal medical therapy, then ultrasound at six months and 12 months. If it's normal, I do not justify repeat ultrasound. And we discussed this and published it over a few years ago. The cost of doing ultrasound once or twice a year for years and years and years, if it's patched, 
and it's normal within a year or two, you're probably losing your time and your money. Now, if it's abnormal, then we repeat accordingly. The next question which we're trying to answer is this question. That's the big gorilla now for carotid disease failed. Should asymptomatic carotid disease defined as above 70 or above 80 if it's three stenosis be treated with CA? And that take me right away for the debate, if any one of you listen to political debate, when Romney debated Obama for the presidential debate, when Obama, forgive me, messed up during that time, and someone else came to show some facts. The proponent of medical therapy, model, uh, modern medical therapy, which I quoted some name mainly from Australia by Abbott, Spence, Canada, and so forth. Even our buddy Veith at the bottom, lately he became proponent of medical therapy. With regards to make the story short, let's see what the fact. And that's what President Clinton came in defense of Obama during that presidential debate or election. What are the facts? None of these studies which they quote were randomized. Everybody know that. None were randomized. In other words, there's no level one evidence against CEA. Stroke rate was quoted to be less than 1% per year for best medical therapy, which I understand why would you do intervention if that's the stroke rate. However, they quoted most of their series, look at number three, above 50% to 99 were all collected together. Who the heck would operate on anybody nowadays with 50 or even 60 and sometimes even 70%. So it really is just not fair to put all these together and say, well, the risk of stroke is less than 1% per year. And you and I know this, look at the bottom one. Only 20% of patients will have a TIA prior to stroke. Therefore, it's a great idea if we could select patient, do we mean we are doing too many unnecessary in in the artrectomies, the answer probably yes. But if you could be very selective, that's the better answer for us. Now, the fact on the other side, the preoperative stroke rate for modern CAA is around 1%. And I shared that with you earlier, 10, 15 minutes ago. 1.4% preoperative stroke and death increased versus 2.3 in the ACAS trial. Combined early and late stroke rate was roughly 2% at five years in our series. Combined stroke and death rate was 2.6% even for crest. And I'm going to remind you, it's probably more than Aburama series, not because I speak with an accent or I'm better. I think simply because you are following specific protocol for 30, 40 years. With the crest, ladies and gentlemen, they allow anybody to do it any way you want to in terms of endotrectomy. In other words, primary closure, patch, aversion, patch, shunt, no shunt, it does not make a difference. So all these were collected and put together at all. These numbers beat, in my mind, any best medical therapy alone. Now, I'm going to spend only a few minutes to touch about carotid stenting trial, because I'm ready to spend the last 10 minutes in some of the carotid guidelines, which we published at the JVS just recently. The most quoted carotid stenting trial is what you see here. The first one is SAFAR, which many people felt it was not really properly conducted, but it's not a big deal. It was for high-risk surgical patients, and if you notice, majority were for asymptomatic patients. But the EV3S, French one, space, German, Crest, American, and a little bit of other international Canadians, ICS started with UK and became international. Take it in one word. All of them without crest showed stroke and death were much worse with stenting than in the artrectomy for symptomatic patients. Now, crest also found stroke rate, stroke and death were twice as much as stenting for stroke and death However, when you add a stroke, death, and in my, the primary endpoint was equivalent. And I always tell my people, these people don't come to me to have a carotid to prevent a heart attack. They don't want to stroke. So therefore, it is really injustice to combine the three together. So if you look into stroke and death, the data suggested clearly 
that stenting was not as good as endarterectomy. But when you add an MI, absolutely, based on crest, they were equivalent. And I'm going to skip all these. Why? Because for the sake of time, I like to spend the time more, but that's what I'm, I'm summarizing to you. But I don't mind spending a few minutes on the crest. Crest to me as much as, well, they say, the best trial. But I still take it with a grain of salt. And why I'm telling you. I think one of the colleagues here will ask me how I'm connecting with Dr. Mark Bate. Mark Bate is an interventional cardiologist. I recruited him over 20 years to join me and start the vascular center. The two years dedicated of peripheral vascular intervention. And this fellow, I have to give him credit, he taught me how to do carotid stenting in 1992-93. Guess what? The guy was one of the early pioneers of carotid stenting. He was not given the green light to do stenting. He was sent to Dallas to attend the course and demonstrate to show so-and-so before they gave him the green light to do stenting. Dr. Abu Ramaz, Dr. Whistlemore dropped me a note in the same day, you are qualified to do carotid endarterectomy. And I'm giving you that an example too. They were absolutely very vigorous in selecting who does carotid stenting. Therefore, from the beginning, you cannot really compare the one who operated with endarterectomy similar to the expert of doing carotid stenting. That's, to me, quite many people do not take it seriously. In spite of that, the perioperative stroke and death, stroke and death, look at the bottom, I always tell my junior, remember, two to one, 2% 2 versus 4% in favor of endarterectomy. But look at NMI, one versus two. Again, twice as much with MI in term of in favor of carotid stenting. When you combine stroke, death, and MI, there was a little edge for endarterectomies, but the p-value was not significant. However, on this follow-up two, three years later, it showed perioperative stroke and death was significantly higher in CAS and CEA. That's a two-year analysis for the symptomatic patient, almost two to one, 6% versus 3%. The bottom one, periprocedural peri stroke and death plus ipsilateral stroke during 10-year follow-up was 8% for CA versus 11% for CAS. One thing to be fair to stenting, ladies and gentlemen, if you look to anything after the 30 days, the stenting and the endarterectomy was somewhat comparable, stroke and death. This is if you exclude perioperative morbidity and mortality. But you have to count this because you have to undergo the procedure. I explained to you about limitation of crest. I'm going to go with this. Now, not only this, add to it the real word for stenting versus CA is not real. It's not what we see in crest. And they have five, six slides, which I'm not going to show you, you here, but I'm going to tell you, take my word for it. It showed the stroke rate with the stenting almost twice as much as was reported in CREST when it comes to stenting. Stroke, stroke and death, everything, and some of these are systemic meta-analysis for both symptomatic and asymptomatic. For the sake of time, I'm going to run quickly with all these. And look at this one here. Systemic review and meta-analysis of CAS versus CA. You compare CAS to CA. One and a half more stroke and death for the whole systemic review, all the entire group. In North America, 1.6 odd ratio of stroke and death in United States. Europe, 1.5. Randomized trial, if you count all the randomized trial, 1.6. Non-randomized trial, 1.4. So this is published a few years ago. Another systemic review, again, talk my, take my word for it, is show in the real world the data even was not as favorable as the randomized trial or what was reported to us. This is similar in nine randomized control trial on this one also. The last slide on this is overview of 20 randomized trial finds CAS result in higher, higher rates for 30 day death or stroke than a CA. And that's published 2019 and that's summary of it. So where do we stand with endarterectomy or stenting? My answer is this. The ACT, which was again expert in stenting, 
for asymptomatic showed stroke and death were equivalent. ACST2 was just published at VIEF, I mean presented at VIEF. The catch here by Halliday, if anybody read this in Lancet, she only looked into the disabling stroke and death, and she took the perioperative data and filled the R equivalent. Like any stroke, if it's not killing you, it's okay. Guess what? This is unfair analysis. But if you read this article at The Lancet just over a month ago, presented at V just two weeks ago, ACS2, European, it telling you they are equivalent. The answer, absolutely no, no, no. What equivalent is disabling stroke and death, but not all stroke and death in this series. Space 2, pending. Chris 2, my understanding from Dr. Tom Ab um, brought over in Orlando two weeks ago. He believed within a year we're going to have some initial data, and they're almost closing the randomization. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, pending randomized trials in progress, CRIS-2, SPACE-2, use of cash should be selective at this stage. As I told one of my colleagues, your colleague yesterday, you have to be selective. There is place for endartrectomy, there is place for T-car, there is place for transfemoral stenting. Must be done by experienced operator centers that's related to stenting particularly. CAS is better treatment for symptomatic patients who are at high surgical risk, whether anatomically or physiologically. The value of CAS in high surgical risk patient, in my mind, is still question mark at this stage. Reversal flow may change these rules in the future of TCAR. If there is a time to answer it, I'll tell you. I'm going to finish my last 10 minutes into, and let's give you 10 minutes for any question, to give you an update of an SVS guideline management of extracranial disease. As I told you, you could refer to the JVS this coming month, or you could see it online. And that's punch of the group who put the guideline together. I was very honored to share this with everybody. And Professor Dalman, who was the president of that year, I think was instrumental in appointing and the executive board appointing the member of that committee. Okay? So we had a dilemma with this, so I could give you a little background. When the AAA guidelines for the SVS were published, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, big volume on the JVS, the clearinghouse would not endorse it as a document for guidelines. They felt it was too big and covering so many things about an aneurysm. To put two years of work and not to be accredited or um, respected, it was kind of hurting. So the SVS executive leadership and the document oversight met together and dig deeply, how do we make sure when we put the guidelines, everybody in America and world are will respect and publish it and it goes through the barrier of the clearinghouse for publications. And we were told you need to put three, four, no more than five items of important to the clinician and also had enough level one evidence or close to level one evidence you could support it with systemic meta-analysis. So we probably spent around two, three meetings, two hours each, and we came out with a question which I'm going to answer it to you, but then we felt this is injustice for the rest of carotid intervention, so we put everything else with a companion document called implementation guidelines. And someone asked me why we did not include the T card there, because there was no level one evidence we could put it on that document of the five question. So we refer to the T card or the implementation document very thoroughly. And that's probably answer the question for so many people. And that's summarizing what I said. So what were the five questions which we felt we need to dig to have answer to it? Is CA recommended over maximum medical therapy for asymptomatic carotid stenosis in low surgical risk patients? As you know, everybody tell you, why do I do an intervention? We discussed that just 10, 15 minutes ago. Maybe best medical therapy is better. So, okay, we're going to dig deeply on this and find out how can we answer it. Is CA recommended over transfemoral carotid stenting in the low surgical patient with symptomatic carotid arthritis above 
is still you talk to cardiologist till you stint is as good as in dartectomy. So we like to answer that question. Three, what is the optimal timing of carotid intervention in patient presenting with acute stroke? Four, screening. Should we really screen patient for carotid disease? And five, what is the optimal sequence for intervention in patients who need combined carotid and coronary artery bypass? That's the first, we follow the PICA guidelines. First question is, you see it here. And unfortunately, there is only two randomized trials up to two years ago, and actually up to now, the ACAS and the ACST, which all of us know the data. And all of us know CA was superior to medical therapy. So I'm not sure we could have changed this, except we felt we have to add somewhere limitation of this conclusion. Why? Best medical therapy of today is different than 20 years ago. However, we refer to this article in the guidelines. Stroke rate for patients even receiving lipid lowering therapy based on the ACST trial. Look at the bottom slide. For patient who are on lipid lower therapy, that's part of randomized trial, was 0.7 per year versus 1.3. We're almost twice as much, even if they were in lipid lowering therapy. If they were not on lipid lowering therapy, the stroke rate was 1.8 for surgical versus 3.3 per year for those on lipid therapy. So looking to the ACS2 trial, we just felt, no, it looked like even with the best medical therapy, it still intervention was better than not, no intervention. Risk stroke in relation to degree of asymptomatic carotid stenosis. And that's what many times being discussed in V symposium over the last two, three years. We cannot put all categories of stroke in the same shape. And this published just a few months ago by Howard at Lancet. Look at this one here. That's a prospective population Oxford vascular study and systemic review and meta-analysis. If you become, if you are specific and you take only the above 70 to 99 percent, the risk of stroke was almost 15 percent versus literally very nil for if you have below 70 percent. And if there's uh, the stenosis above 80 to 99 percent, 18 versus 1 percent, then if it's 52, it's then an 80. So this study definitely strongly endorsed above 70% is not the same as above 50 or above 60%. So what were our recommendations for question number one? In low surgical risk patient with asymptomatic carotid stenosis for above 70, we recommend CEA with best medical therapy over maximum medical therapy alone for long term prevention of stroke and death, and we gave this grade 1B. We also gave a specific criteria, which is even make the recommendation higher. If you have the following category, which might put patient into somewhat higher risk of stroke, stenosis progression, silent infarct on the CTOMR, plaque equalescency, intraplaque hemorrhage, large plaque area, or spontaneous embolization, which is very troubling. You can do TCD on everybody asymptomatic, but that's something many of our European colleagues emphasize. Now, what do we recommend to? We decided intervention based on the risk of patients. For example, revascularization, we offer CAA, but high risk for CAA on clinical judgment, which include all of you now neck radiation, previous CA, previous neck surgery, stomas, lesion above two, contralateral vocal cord lesion, and so on, or medical high risk. High risk for TCAR, heavy calcified carotid lesion, lesion within 5 cm of clavicle, common carotid of less than 6 mm, neck radiation, tracheal stoma, medical high risk. High risk for transfemoral, age above 75, heavy calcified lesion, complex bifurcation lesion, arch type 3, and so forth. So there are really indication to each category as was recommended. Let's go on to question number two. Is carotid endartrectomy recommended over transfemoral stenting in low surgical risk? 
we rely on the four randomized trial which we listed here and that's putting the systemic and review meta-analysis of all of them together. If you look, almost every one of them on the left side favoring CA versus endartrectomy. And remember now, we looked onto only stroke and death. That's for 30 days and also for five years. Three out of four favor CA versus CAS based on the systemic and, uh, and meta-analysis. So what we did, recommendation CA over transfemoral with low standard risk for about 50% symptomatic, and we felt really not only really grade one, grade one A. Question number three, what is the optimal timing for carotid intervention? To summarize it to you quickly, as I indicated to you earlier, if there is indication because the stroke is limited, preferably the first two weeks, and CA was somewhat in favor than stenting for these type of patients. Question number four, screening. The evidence was taken from primarily this table. Well, regardless, recommendation against, I'll show it to you in a second, routine screening for clinically asymptomatic patients in patients who, had, who have no cerebrovascular symptoms or significant risk factor for carotid artery disease, and we gave this a grade 1B. But there are specific high-risk asymptomatic patients which screening might justify, as you see from this table. Starting with the shaded like patient with PAD or PAD and coronary artery disease or PAD smoking and anything in the bottom. If the prevalence of significant disease is above 20%, we felt perhaps a screening is justified. And that's the category of patient where we felt screening is justified. High risk patient and we gave it grade 2 B. The evidence is not very strong, but the categories in the bottom of the slide are what we recommend. Perhaps maybe you consider selective screening. And finally, what is the optimal sequence of intervention in patients with combined carotid and coronary? This is the question which we really do not have very strong evidence for it at all. The data is not very strong there, but based on the consensus of the group, you could read this here, and the grading was only 2C. Patient with symptomatic carotid stenosis and 50 to 99 who require both CE and cabbage suggest CA before or concomitant with cabbage to decrease the risk of stroke. Now, this are if they are symptomatic, and we also lifted on the clinical presentation and institutional experience. In patients with severe 7 to 99 bilateral disease and it's asymptomatic or contralateral carotid occlusion suggests CA before or concomitant with cabbage. Thank you very much. Hopefully I covered most of what I need to cover for you.